now. Okay. So I got everything recording now. Um, then we go to over here. So there are a few um, documents in the share folder that is going to be useful. Um, so right now, um, I'm going to go to the opcode table. And then later on today, we are going to go to the assembler. There's also the assembler manual, which <clears throat> it's kind of useful, okay? If you can have some time to read the manual, it can also be very useful. But for the time being, we are going to go to the opcode table. So the opcode table is really just a table, okay? Even though it is in the form of a spreadsheet, it doesn't do that much as a spreadsheet. I can see a bunch of people are already here, okay? That's good. So um, with the assembler or the opcode table, it is basically a lookup table. Um, the best column to read first, for those of you who are starting with, you know, just starting to learn what this is all about, would be column C, okay? So we can start with column C, and we'll start with something that's easy, like row 21. So we'll go to row 21, and column C says, you know, this is going to add two things, X and Y, and then store the sum back into X. So the question is, what is X and what is Y? So if we scroll up you know, to the very beginning, it says right here, <clears throat> if you want the registers to be A, B, C, or D, then you need to specify you know, um, 0, 0 for A, 0, 1 for B, 1, 0 for C, and then 1, 1 for D. So those refer to X, X, and Y, Y. You know, basically, those are the two bit um, in an opcode to specify which register we want to work with. So if I go back to here, so the instruction, you know, the um, column A is called the actual opcode. It is in binary. So those are the zeros and ones. And when you see, you know, a one or a zero, that means it literally has to be a zero or one for those positions. When you see XX or YY, that means you know, the XX and YY depends on what registers we are using. And those registers refer to the single X and the single Y in the other columns, okay? And the single X and the single Y can be register A, B, C, or D. They are all within the register bank. So I'll show everything back in the larger sim <clears throat> in just a little bit. Um, and then column D is just a verbal description of what the instruction does. So in this case, all it does is to add. In fact, it is adding two registers and then put the result, which is the sum, back into you know, one of the registers. Column B is what we call the mnemonic. In other words, if you want to specify the instruction, you can try to memorize you know, the binary code for everything, but that's really difficult for most people, myself included. It is much easier to remember the mnemonic, which is what the assembler is going to do, is it will convert from the mnemonic back into the binary code. The processor only understands the binary code, which is in column A, but when we write the code, it is usually better to write the code in mnemonic, which is column B. Column C is what we call a register transfer language, or RTL. It describes what the instruction does at a slightly higher level compared to the circuit level. Are we still, are we doing okay so far with just the general concept of how to make use of this table? Maybe not, okay, because you know, I have to kind of illustrate how everything works in this case. So what we'll do today is I will use this particular instruction, the add instruction, and we are going to specify an opcode um, to add two registers, and then we'll track down in the processor and see how this is done. So that's what we're going to do today. <clears throat> so the first thing I'm going to do is simply to write it out. Okay, so I will use mouse pad for this purpose. So I'm just writing this in text here. Let me start a new window. Move this one out of the way. Move this one into your view. So what I want to do is to say, let's go ahead and add register B and C. Okay, so I want to store the sum of register B and register C back into register B. <clears throat> so according to the mnemonic here, okay, according to the mnemonic, this is the instruction called add BC. 
So <clears throat> register B is both providing a value for the addition, but it's also the register that will store the result of the operation. But we, all, we can also figure out the opcode. So in this case, the opcode is going to be 1000, and that has to be you know, the constants. But then we specify XX. Register B has a bit pattern of what again? I mean, some of you have already opened the spreadsheet. You can scroll back up again and look up what is the bit pattern for register B. Zero, one, right? Okay. So zero, one is representing register B. Uh, how about register C? One, zero. Very good. Okay. So that means the actual binary bit pattern for performing this operation is 1000, which is an 8 in hexadecimal, 0110, which is a 6 in hexadecimal. So we're looking at 86 in hexadecimal, so we can program that directly into the RAM if we want to do so. So do we have any questions right now? I think there may be a lot of open-ended questions right now because you know there's not enough context to really make all the connections together. So what I'm going to do next is going to kind of put all the pieces together. Is that okay so far? All right. <clears throat> so the first thing I would do is to use the assembler. I'm going to put this out of the way. Is to use the assembler. The assembler is right here. That's just the name of the assembler. assembler. The assembler for this class is in the form of a Google Sheet. Um, do not attempt to put this into Excel. It is not going to work in Excel. This only works as a Google Sheet. So if I go to the Source tab, and something is not right here with my browser, for whatever reason, it doesn't update here when I'm using Google Sheet. So there's some kind of incompatibility between Firefox and um, Google Sheets here. So what I can do is I can erase the entire column A. So I select the entire column A and press the delete key. And now I just say the same thing, add BC. So the assembler is basically your assistance. Instead of having you to figure out all the zeros and ones for every opcode, which you can, okay, but it's a lot of extra work, okay? It's, it's really tedious. So the assembler can do this for you. So if I put in the actual mnemonic, and it's going to update after a while. Okay, complains about the name because. Okay, let me refresh it. Okay, so it's all good now. <clears throat> and then I go to the RAM file, or I can go to the assemble view. So in, in the assemble view, it would actually give me the opcode already. If you look at the column X on row one, it is putting the whole thing together and tell me that the opcode is eight six in hexadecimal, okay? <clears throat> That's basically the job of an assembler, okay? It doesn't matter what platform or what architecture you're using, the job of the assembler is to convert from mnemonic into opcode so that the processor can understand you know, what it needs to do. Is that okay? All right. There's also another tab here called RAM file. This is intended for you to download the content. So once again, you know, when I switch the tab, you know, the browser does not automatically update. I have to manually you know, click the refresh button. So what we have here is um, the RAM file. So the way you make use of the RAM file is to, to go to File, and then you go to Download, and then you can either use the CSV for comma-separated value or TSV, which is tab separated value. Either one works, but my convention is to use CSV for this purpose. So when you click this, it will download you know, to somewhere on your computer. Um, I would choose a name, okay? So I'm just gonna change the name of the file that I'm downloading to add.csv and then click save. So now I have the file saved as add.csv. Add so now I can go back to the uh, logic sim window like this. <clears throat> I can now slide over to the RAM module. Now, since we only have one single instruction, I could have just you know, put it in like here using the poking tool. Well, actually, I don't even, yeah, I'm using the poking tool and just type you know, 8, 6 over. So that's my program, okay? My program has one single opcode to add register C to register B. 
That's all it's supposed to do. But if you say, okay, but what about that file that we just downloaded? How do we, how do we make use of that file? So in order to illustrate how that file works, I'm going to erase the content of RAM using this button here. So what, I, what I'm pointing to right now, this is an, a button, okay? It's a virtual button. If you click that button, it is going to clear the content of RAM because that button connects to, connects to clear, reset, zero, okay? They're all basically the same thing, okay? It clears the entire content of the RAM module, not just the location that is being addressed at this, po at this point, it's the entire content. So now I can right click on the RAM, <clears throat> go to load image, and then go to the folder. I can just type over the folder here. It's in, the, in my temp folder. It's called add.csv. And then I click open. And you can see that the content of the file, which consists of only specifying one location, is now back in RAM. So you can either you know, hand copy everything over or you can just you know, load the entire file into the RAM module. Okay, so now that we have this instruction in here, the next thing we need to do is to execute the instruction. So I am not going to repeat what we already talked about on Tuesday. <clears throat> so the first thing we do is to look at the microcode pointer. It always starts at location 000. So we have control T, you know, which loads the opcode into the instruction register. So observe the instruction register here. Control T, there we go, we have 86 in it. Control T again, the microcode pointer will increment to 001, okay, like so. And now we are ready for another rising edge. I believe that I forgot, to, oh, I think I already talked about the auto increment of the program counter. So when I control T again, the program counter is going to increment from 00, 0 to 0, 01. I believe that was the end of the previous lecture. Is that correct? Okay, so control T again. The program counter is now at 0, 01. Now the next thing is something that I have not talked about yet. This is the decode phase of executing an instruction. So we are about to have a rising edge or a falling edge. A falling edge, very good, because the clock it already has a one, so that means that when I type control T again, it is going to be a falling edge. Um, is anything sensitive to the falling edge? So we, we talked about this on Tuesday. Of the entire processor, only one thing is sensitive to a falling edge, yes. That would be the microcode pointer, okay? This register is the only one that updates on the falling edge. So now the question is, how is it gonna update? <clears throat> Most people think, oh, it's gonna increment to 002. Nope, that's not what it's gonna do. So we have to go through the analysis. So in order to find out how microcode pointer is gonna update, we look at the D port because that's the input that provides the value to update the register. So we, we want to track down who is providing a value to the D port. Well, that's an easy answer, okay, because it's just coming from the multiplexer. But that doesn't tell us exactly where it's coming from. A multiplexer is nothing more than a switch. In other words, um, I just know the switch position, but I don't know which train, where, where did it come from, okay? I want to know where the train came from, you know, before it got to the switch. So in this case, we can see the select, you know, is a dark green, which is a zero. So that means input zero is connected to the output for this particular multiplexer. So now we have to track down input zero and ask, okay, so who is providing the value to input zero of this multiplexer? So we track it back to something that is kind of suspicious looking because it is a, it's a, it's a, a splitter, which is also a merger, depending on which direction you look at. So um, with this particular splitter, I know it's difficult for you to see, so I'm gonna say it. The top split end says zero to three. In other words, bit zero, one, two, and three came from a constant of zero. So don't ask me why the, the least significant four bits are all zeros, because they come from a constant of zero, that's all, okay? What about bit four to bit 11? Because that's the label for the bottom split end of the splitter, 
it's 4 to 11. So bit 4 to bit 11, they come from the tunnel called instruction, okay? So once again, you know, tunnels are basically convenience features so that we can um, make logical connections between different points in the circuit without having to draw the wires all over the place. So in this particular case, this instruction tunnel is connected to this instruction tunnel because they have exactly the same name. So that means this wire is really logically connected to this wire. So that means 86 coming from the instruction register is providing bit set bit 8 to 11 of the split end of the merger. Is that okay? So what are we going to end up with here once we update? Because now that we know that bit 7, excuse me, bit 8 to 11 is 86 coming from the instruction register, bit 0 to 3 are just zeros coming from the constant of 0. So the question is, how am I going to update the microcode pointer? Can someone tell me the three digits that should be in the microcode pointer as soon as I type Control T so that we have a falling edge? I'll give you uh, two choices. Is it going to be 860 or is it going to be 086? 860 is the answer because the zero is padded in as the least significant bit, the most significant bits would be eight and six, okay? So here is control T, <clears throat> and we can see two things happening. First of all, the micro code pointer is now 860, and then the address or the addressed location in the ROM is also now at 860. This part is called decoding, okay? So we, we just decoded the opcode so that we get to the location in ROM that specifies what are we going to do, you know, in this particular instruction. Is that okay? Do we have any questions up to this point of the demonstration? Okay, all right. So now that we are a, at, um, <clears throat> uh, the ROM is addressing location 860, which has a really weird looking content of what, 150E5D8. So it, you can break it up into all 26 zeros and ones, but it's not gonna be very helpful you know, to do that. What is more helpful is to look for the five or eight things that we talked about on Tuesday. So what are the eight things that we should be looking at? Well, I took notes, I shared my notes with you guys, okay? And I encourage the whole class to also take notes you know, on that day. So do you remember what are the four, five, or eight things, depending on how you look at it, that we should look at? Okay, go ahead, back there. Registers, okay. Go ahead, what are those registers? Uh huh. Yep. Okay. Very good. That's exactly what we should do. So we are going to go to the instruction, the register bank here. This is the register bank, and this particular port is input enable, which means if it is a one, that means one of the four registers in the register bank is going to be updated. So this is telling me that, huh? Maybe we should look into it. So I right click, go into the register bank, and register B is about to update. Is that okay? All right, so I'm gonna write down a note here, okay? So I am just writing down my note here and just say that register B is enabled, okay? Just so that I can keep track of things, you know, because otherwise it's really hard for me to keep track of a lot of different things. So as soon as you know that register B is going to be updated, what is the natural next question to ask? Hmm? Who is providing the value to update register B? Okay, excellent, okay? So we, the next question to ask is, so who is providing a value to update with register B? Now, because register B and register C are both zero, zero at this point, so it's not really a whole lot of fun to look at how we add zero, zero to get zero, zero back. 
zero, we are adding zero zero to zero zero to get zero zero back. So it's not going to be visible at all with any change. So I'm going to change the value of register B and C to something other than zero zero. So with this one, we can put in, we'll, we'll put in something that will even cause a, you know, um, the, the overall carry to become a one. So I will put in like a F7 here. And then over here, we put in like a, a four, two, okay? It's just kind of random, but I just want to make sure that we end up with a ca overall carry of one, okay? All right, so we know the enable is a one, and the only thing we need to track down is the uh, D port of register B, because that is how register B is going to be updated. So if I click on this node, it goes to one of the input pins. It's register in, you know, from inside the register bank. So now I have to go back out into the main circuit to track down, okay, who is now driving, you know, that particular pin? The value is not important right now. I just want to know which input port is going to provide the value to update register B. So one thing you might notice is that node, the node that we have highlighted right here, it's also going to the D port of register D, the D port of register C, and also the D port of register A. Are those registers going to update also? Nope, because the only one that has the enable being a one is register B. So this kind of, this is consistent with what we talked about when we talked about uh, D flip-flops. So the enable pin is only useful to say, Hey, who is supposed to update? Because your know, multiple registers can connect to the same node. All right, so now what we do is we go back to the main circuit, and now we ask, okay, who is driving this wire? Because that wire is going into the um, register in uh, port of the register bank. It's coming out of a multiplexer. So now we ask, okay, uh, which input connects to the output with this particular uh, multiplexer. So there are a few things we need to first you know, analyze is first of all, can this multiplexer be, be disabled? The answer is yes, it can be disabled because it has an enable pin here. But right now the enable pin is a one, which means the multiplexer is indeed enabled. So that means, okay, now we really have to figure out you know, how it is uh, choosing its input. That it would be the gray dot. So the gray dot is always above the select port, which is the, the purpose of the select port is to tell us which input connects to the output in the case of a multiplexer. So it is a bright green. So that means input one connects to the output with this multiplexer. So now we have to track down input one. So we highlight that wire. This is an easy one because it doesn't drop all over the place. It comes from the output of this thing here. This is what we call the ALU in the processor. It stands for arithmetic and logic unit, okay? All the computations of the processor, they're all performed by the ALU, okay? So now we look at this and go like, okay, so we now need to you know, shift our focus to the ALU and we want to know what is happening with the ALU. So I'm just gonna write down on my note here, okay? So right here, I just say that um, register B dot D, or the D port of register B, uh, is from the ALU output. Okay, the reason why I want to write it down is because I cannot mentally track a whole lot of things. So by writing it down, you know, I can later on go back and go like, okay, wait a minute here. You know, where is that thing connected to? Right, okay, we figured it out already. The output of the ALU connects to the input of register B, okay? So now the question is, what is, um, the, what is connecting to the ALU? Okay, so we'll try to figure out from the outside first. So the ALU has two inputs, in one and in zero. So we want to figure out who is driving in one of the ALU. So that means we track on this wire. It's coming from a D multiplexer. This particular D multiplexer can be enabled or disabled because it has the enable pin here. But because the enable pin is bright green using this particular tunnel, this tunnel comes from the ROM. So we don't have to go any further to explain why this is a bright green because it is the ROM that determines that register output zero enable 
is a 1. Is that okay? So what we do need to find out is, is this output connected to the only input? And the only way we can find that answer is to look at this wire, which is register, register output 0D multiplexer. So we're going to poke that wire and see what kind of bit pattern we see over there. So let's see, it's this wire, click it, and it is a 1, <clears throat> which is the same as a 0 1. So, so we are good, okay? Because you know, what this means is output 1 of the D multiplexer is connected to the input, and the D multiplexer is indeed enabled. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's not sleeping. So now we want to track down this wire and go like, Okay, so who, what inside the register bank is driving this highlighted your wire over here? So guess what? We have to go back into the register bank to figure that out. So we go back into the register bank, and this wire is the wire that we are concerned about. So if you ever need to um, find out you know, which port is connected, connected to which part of the circuit, the best way to do it is to go to the packaging of the component, okay, which is the register bank. So you go to the register bank, you switch back to the um, appearance mode, and then what you do is you poke a particular pin here, just you click it, okay, click the pin, not the orientation. So you can see it displays in a picture in a picture, of kind of like a miniature version of the actual circuit, and it highlights the actual port from inside the circuit that corresponds to the pin or the port on the packaging that you have selected. So this is a way for you to figure out, okay, are we really sure that thing you know, in the packaging is connected to that port that I think it is connected to? That's how you figure that out. All right, so now we can go back to what we were working on earlier, which is right click on it here, go to register bank, and then we ask, so what is driving this wire? So the way we do this is kind of continue to go backwards. This is coming from a multiplexer, and this multiplexer does not have an enable, so it's always enabled. Um, so can someone tell me which one of the input is driving the wire that is now highlighted? Mm -hmm. the, the output coming from B, yep, because you know, the select says you know, 0, 1, so that means input 1, which is, oh, not this one, input 1 is connected to the output of this multiplexer, and the output here is coming from register B itself. Are we good so far? All right, so because I cannot remember so many things, I'm going to write down here and say register B.Q, which is the output, connects to alu.in1, okay? So because those are the endpoints that are important. So now we go back to the main circuit, and then we ask, what about in2? Who is connected to in2 of the alu? This is the alu, this is in2. So now we go like, hmm, okay, so let's try to figure out what connects to in2 of the alu. It comes from a multiplexer again, so that means you know, we have to figure out what is the select of this multiplexer. The select of this multiplexer is dark green. Yeah, I ran out of space when I put this in, so I had to kind of put the connection right next to the um, component, which makes it a little bit hard to see. But this is input zero, okay, or it specifies a zero. So input zero connects to the output of this multiplexer. Now the, so, so this means you know, it is coming out of this particular demultiplexer. This particular demultiplexer has no enable. It is always enabled. But the, um, the select here is a bright green. So that means output one connects to the input. So now we have to track down who is uh, driving out one of the, AO, of the register bank. So once again, we right click and go into the register bank. And then we are talking about this particular port here. So now it, so what do you think? Who is connected ultimately to this particular output pin? Register C, very good. Because the select is a one zero, which is a two. So that means 
0, 1, 2, this particular input 2 is connected to the output for the multiplexer. But when you track down this wire, it goes, it comes from the D, a Q port of register C. So now we just you know, figure out you know, how those th two things are connected. So I'm going to make a note here <clears throat> and say that register C dot Q connects to ALU dot in two. Okay, so now we kind of know, you know, how the registers are connected to the ALU, but we don't know what the ALU is doing, okay? We just know the connectivity between, you know, the register bank and the ALU. So now what we need to do is to get, take a closer look at the ALU. So this is the ALU. It is kind of, a, you know, it's, it's a kind of bigger component. So we know that register B dot Q is connected to this input pin, register C dot Q is connected to, the, to this pin over here. So when you look at you know, both of these, okay, both of these connections, they both connect to their own demultiplexer. In other words, we basically just kind of do a fan out to different components over here. So can somebody tell me um, which component we are connecting it to? From the from tracking down the the multiplexer, do we know which component? You just you can just name the component. This is zero, one, two, three, four, five. So which one of these components are we connecting both of the input pins to? The first one, zero. Very good. How do we know? Because when you look at the select of both of these two demultiplexers. They are all being selected by op cell or operation select. An operation select, which is op, which is selecting what operation we want to perform inside the ALU, is zero zero zero. So that zero 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 is connected to both of these these, these two demultiplexers. So that means this connects to output zero. This also connects to output zero. In other words. Now we have the output of register B going to the first input of this adder. Register C is going to the second input of the adder. Are we good so far? Okay. So the adder has no K0. So K0 is assumed to be zero here. So the output here is really just um, the addition, the binary sum of register B and register C. Are we still doing okay so far? All right. It has an overall carry of one, which is you know, this Y over here. So now we have two things to track, okay? The first one is easier. I'm gonna track the actual output, which is the sum, and we wanna see where is it going? So the way it's going, or the way we determine which way it's going is to say, oh, it's going into a multiplexer. A multiplexer has multiple input and one single output. The question is, which input is it, is it connecting to the output? And you can see that it is using the same select, okay? So if you look at the select of this multiplexer, it is also zero, zero, zero. So that means input zero, which is the result of the sum, is now connected to this wire, which connects to the output pin over here. So that output pin, if I go back to the main circuit, is corresponding to this output output wire over here. So that's why register B is getting the sum between itself and the content of register C. Is that okay? Hmm? Register B will be updated. Yep, that is correct. So now we want to double check and make sure that you know, it is update, it's going to be updated to the right value. So we are going back to the register bank, and then we ask, okay, what should we get um, if we add F7 to 42? Okay, so I'm gonna perform the math here. So I'm switching gear just a little bit to perform addition, not in base two, but in hexadecimal. <clears throat> because the exam already gave you a question of what, base eight addition? If you can do base 8 addition, you can do base 16 addition as well. <coughs> the rules are the same. It's just, it just feels a little awkward. 
So we are dealing with F7 plus, <coughs> excuse me, 4, 2. <coughs> and then we have one row for the Q, another row for the carries, and then another row for the sum. Okay, so we just have to go back and fill in these things. <coughs> so um, this is going to be a zero because we saw that you know there's a carry, there's a K zero being zero, you know, when we configure the adder. So this one is definitely a zero. Seven plus two is a nine in base 16. Nine plus zero is just a nine. And now we have no carry from um, digit zero. So now we have F plus four. So you go like, oh man, how do we do F plus four? It's the same thing that we do, you know, with um, any other base. F is representing the quantity of 15. So 15 plus four is 19. So with a 19, we have to mod it with 16 because we're dealing with base 16 here. So 19 mod 16 is a three. So that means you know, this digit here is gonna be a three. What about the carry? The question is, is 19 greater than or equal to 16? Yes, okay, so we end up with a carry over here and then the three plus the zero is easy, it's just three. So that means we are expecting 3, 9 to be <clears throat> the value that we use to update register B, and at the same time, that should also be a carry of 1. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so now we can just poke the wire going into the D port of B because you know, we are about to update already, and if we poke that wire, it tells us it is indeed 3, 9 in hexadecimal. So we did the calculation correctly. Okay, very good. So we know the register B will update to 3.9, but there are a few other things that I kind of need to explain, okay, because we are here already. So the next question is, is the flags register going to be updated? So you look at the flags register, the enable is bright green, which means it is enabled. So it is going to be, it's going to be updated. You can also see that the red wire that normally is here is now black, which means we do have some valid values to update the flags register. So the next question is, hmm, what are we gonna use to update the flags register? So we go back into the, process, in, into the ALU, and then this time we are tracking down the flags register, which is you know, connected to the flags out, you know, output pin. And this one is a little bit complicated, okay? But it is not complicated enough that we cannot figure it out. So this connects to C out as a tunnel, and you can see this is C out as a tunnel. It's coming from a multiplexer. This multiplexer select is also connected to OPSEL, which means you know, it is also just selecting input zero, and that's coming from a tunnel just with just C, which we saw earlier. That's the carry out of the adder. <clears throat> Are we good so far? So bit zero of the flex register is ultimately the care overall carry of the adder. What about the other bits? Okay, we'll track those down one by one. So this is Z out, okay? The second bit one is Z out. So now we have to track down, okay, who is C out in this circuit? So C out in this circuit is right here. This is C out. So C out is the, is the NOR of all the bits of the result of the operation. So we take every bit of the result of the operation and then we do a gigantic NOR, a negated OR of this thing, and that becomes Z out. So the Z flag is called the zero flag because the zero flag is a one if and only if the result of the ALU is zero, okay? So does that make sense, okay? If the result is zero, that means that all of these wires would be zero. The OR of all the zeros would be, no, the OR, just OR. So the OR of all the zeros would be zero. That's the only time you have a zero out of an OR is all the inputs are zeros. But because this is a NOR, which means it is negated, so that becomes a one. If everything is a zero, then the Z out is gonna be a one. <clears throat> is that okay? So the Z flag is a one if and only if the result of the operation is a zero. Okay, 
that's going to bit one of the flex register. So now we have bit two. So this one is S out, okay, sign out. So sign out is actually really easy. This is sign out right here. Um, it may be difficult for you guys to see what the splitter is doing here. The splitter is taking the output of the entire operation and extract only bit seven, which is the most significant bit, and that becomes S out or sign the sign bit. So that is the same thing as the sign bit of the difference when we are performing a subtraction, but we do the same thing when we have an addition here as well. <clears throat> so that would be bit two. Bit three is this wire. It's coming out of O out, okay, which is overflow. So O out is a little bit complex, okay, because O out is actually here. It is also going through a multiplexer, and this multiplexer is also selected you know, using OPSEL, which has a value of 0, 0, 0 for addition. So that means we are taking input 0 to connect to the output. And this one here, it connects to an OR gate, and it's taking in S1, S2, and also S out. So this particular circuit here is, is trying to figure out, do we have an overflow but from an addition? Okay, so do we have a signed number overflow you know, out of a, an addition? So I'm not gonna get into the details to talk about this circuit here, but it's basically the counterpart of how we determine whether there's an overflow for subtraction, but this one applies to addition. To, uh, to, to understand this you know, really quickly, we're basically asking, if we to add two non-negative values, and it ends up, do we end up with a negative value? If it does, then we have an overflow. Because when you add two non-negative values, you should never end up with a negative value. Or are we adding two negative values and end up with a non-negative value? That would also indicate that we have an overflow. So just you know, if I want to explain it very briefly, that's basically what this particular circuit is trying to do, is to determine after an addition, are we, is the result of the addition outside of the range of what a signed number can represent? <clears throat> so that one is going to bit three of the output, which is this particular wire. And this is the last one. Oh, I clicked the wrong one. This is, this is the bit three. This is bit four, which is the last bit. This is the exclusive OR between the sign and the overflow, which we normally call the L flag after a subtraction. After an addition, it's not particularly useful, so we are usually ignoring the L flag after an addition. But nonetheless, it is still a value. So then we go back out to the circuit here, and we go like, oh, okay, so that's how we're gonna update the flags register. So the flags register, the job of the flags register is to remember every single flag after an addition or a subtraction so that we can use the flags for something else later on. That something else is usually a decision-making kind of thing. So we can say, hey, if the, o, if the L flag is a one, we go this way. If the L flag is a zero, we go the other way. Because that's the only way you can make decisions when you're programming in assembly language. All right. So I think we got everything already to figure out, okay? But just to be sure, we want to make sure RAM is not enabled. We're not doing anything with RAM. <clears throat> the program counter is not enabled. We are not updating the program counter. The instruction register is also not enabled. We are not doing anything with the instruction register. So when I type Control-T, we would expect register B to update to 3.9 in hexadecimal. The flex register will update to the value that we talked about earlier with bit zero being a one. So let's go ahead and do a control T. So after the control T, you can either go into the register, but you can also rely on these output pins to see the values of register B. So we can see the register B indeed has a value of three nine in hexadecimal because the most significant four bits are zero zero one one, which is a three the least significant four bits are 1001, which is the nine. So we have that confirmation. The flags register, on the other hand, <clears throat> has the value of 00001, because the only flag that has a one is the carry flag. 
but you can see how this is just connected to the um, output of the flags register. So that's why we I don't have to click on the flags register to see it. <clears throat> so are we good so far? So what we have done is we have just executed an instruction. This is called the execute phase of an instruction. It performs what the instruction is supposed to do. We good so far? All right. So the important part of this particular demonstration is not so much what the add instruction does, but how do we figure out what how it gets the job done? Is that okay? Let me say that one more time, okay? The most important part of this demonstration is about how we figure out how the processor gets the job done. You know, how do we figure out how things are connected? Whose output connects to whose input? Basically, that's the question. Are there any questions at this point? If there are no questions, then the next thing we need to do is a falling edge. And the only thing that is sensitive to a falling edge is the microcode pointer. So now we go back to the microcode pointer, and then we ask when we have a falling edge, because the clock is now high, the next control T will make it low, making it a falling edge. So now we look at the input to the microcode pointer, the D port, it's coming out of this D multiplexer. The multiplexer has a select of one, which means input one connects to the output. Input one comes from the adder here. So that means the microcode pointer is gonna increment to 861. But if you do a control T right now, you will not see that the microcode pointer goes to 861, and instead what you will see is it goes back to zero right away. You go like, how, okay? So let me demonstrate what I, what I, what I let me demonstrate what I said earlier. So control T, ding, oh, it's like, how did it go back to location zero, zero, zero? The magic has to do with the, the content at location to, uh, 861, okay? So we'll go ahead and take a look at location 861. Right click on the ROM, go to edit content, and we want to get to location 861. So scroll down, 86, okay, right here. Okay, so 86, this is 860, which was where we were before. This is location 861. You go like, okay, it's two followed by six zeros. What is so special about it? Well, convert it into base two first, okay? If you convert two followed by six zeros into binary, you will end up with a one followed by 25 zeros. In other words, bit 25 is the only bit that is one. Everything else are zeros. They go like, that doesn't sound like it would explain why the, reg why the microcode pointer goes all the way back to zero. Well, instead of you know, trying to figure that out, looking at the number, what we do is we just simply look at the output of the ROM and then we ask, where is bit 25 going? Because that becomes a one at location 861. This is um, bit 25, and we can see that it goes into an OR gate, and the output of the OR gate goes to where? The clear of the microcode pointer. So as soon as bit 25 coming out of the ROM becomes a one, at location 861, that one goes to the OR gate. The OR gate is gonna go like, oh, okay, your output is gonna be a one. But that output of one goes to the clear of the microcode pointer. That's how the microcode pointer got reset back to zero, zero, zero. When the microcode pointer is back to location zero, 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 we are ready to fetch and we are, we are, we are beginning the execution cycle of the next opcode, which we are not terribly interested in right now, simply because um, we only have one instruction in this entire program, which is adding register C to register B. All right, so I have just explained you know, the whole thing of how things connect inside the processor and how to analyze you know, the connection 
Do we have any questions about here what I just demonstrated? Is it a lot of tedious detail? The answer is yes, okay? There's no way around it. But that's also why, you know, I actually wrote some notes here, okay? Because I was tracking, as soon as I figure out the, the endpoints, I know the register, register B is enabled, which means it's about to, about to be updated. I also, you know, made the connection so that I know that register D, I mean, excuse me, port D of register B, which is which specifies the input of the register, is coming from the out from the ALU, okay? That's from the overall view of the processor. The output of register B goes to the input one of the ALU. The output of register C goes to in two of the ALU. And then we proceeded to go into the ALU to try to figure out, okay, what is it doing? And how, how does it compute the in, based on the input and who's the output? How are the flags you know, uh, determined? And that's basically how we eventually figure out you know, what the processor is going to do with that one opcode of 86 in hexadecimal. <clears throat> Are we doing okay so far? Okay. Ultimately, what you need to do is to go through this exercise a few times yourself. So I'm going to give you guys you know, a little bit of homework assignment that I'm not going to grade. So I want you to do a subtraction of register A from register D. Initialize register D to, okay, whatever value you want, okay? Let's say, you know, zero, eight, and initialize register A to something else. And we want to cause an overflow this time. So let's see how we can cause an overflow when you are subtracting from zero, eight. Well, I think if we subtract the most negative value from zero, eight, it's going to overflow. And eight zero in hexadecimal represents the most negative value in uh, in base, um, excuse me, in an a bit number. So perform this operation and do what I just did with the addition. So that means that what you can do is to rewind today's lecture video all the way back to when I get to the point where it starts to execute, or you know, actually go through the whole process. You can use the assembler to determine you know, what is the opcode of sub DA, and then poke that value into the first location of RAM, and then just do what I did earlier today. Going through this a few times is gonna be helpful, okay? Because as I said, it is not so much the conclusion of the demonstration that is important, it is the process of the demonstration that is important. <clears throat> I compared the result of the demonstration as a value in calculus. The process of how we get there is the first derivative. I care a lot more about the derivative than the actual value. Why do you think that is, why do you think the derivative is more important than the actual value? Okay, if you have not taken calculus, you can ignore that question. <laughs> Because when you have a non-negative derivative, even if the value is low to begin with, you know it's going to go up. So that is why the, the derivative is important. So even if the first deriv derivative is low, if your second derivative is relatively high or at least non-zero, that's even better. Because when you have a non-zero and non-negative second derivative, that means your first derivative will eventually become non-negative and it's going to go up, which also means your actual value will also go up, you know, eventually. So, you know, that's, that's the way I look at things. So the process is far more important than the end result. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So if you don't absorb everything in today's lecture, like during the lecture itself, it's okay, okay, you know, there's a lot of stuff here, a lot of details, um, and you really kind of need to know the multiplexers, the multiplexers and registers really well to really absorb the material. Um, so that means, you know, you might need to spend some time to review you know, today's lecture and just kind of follow the steps one by one and do it slowly, okay? 
Do we have any questions right now? Because if there are no other questions, yes, go ahead. The ALU, mm -hmm, the Arithmetic and Logic Unit. All right, so let's switch to the, <clears throat> so you want to look inside the ALU, okay? And which portion do you want to look at? You mean the Z out, how Z out is computed from here? No, that is not what I said. <laughs> so did anyone write down what I said? Regarding, you know, how the value of Z out is determined from the individual bits of the result of an operation. Sorry? They all have to be zero in order for Z out to become a one. Yep. Because we have a nor, and in order for the output of a regular or to be a zero, all the inputs need to be zeros. If at least one bit of here is a one, then the output of the or is going to be a one. But this is not a regular or, this is a nor, because it's, it's a negated or. So that means if at least one bit of the result of, of an operation is a one, which means the result is non-zero, then the Z flag is gonna be a zero. All right. <clears throat> so that kind of reminds me of, you know, note taking, you know, the importance, not only the importance of note taking, but also, you know, you know the accuracy of note taking. When the whole lecture is being recorded, it is not as big of a problem because you can always go back and you know, go to the exact instant of time when I talk about a certain thing. But if a lecture is not recorded, which I think is the majority of the classes, um, then you kind of have to figure out a way to take notes in a very accurate way. Okay, you know, so that's kind of that's kind of important. All right. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So I'm. So we we just did uh, we just did a lot of detailed work. Okay. In other words, um, I'm basically picking up a lot of pine needles and I'm making you know shapes out of the pine needles. Okay. So it's time for us to take a step back to look at the branches of the pine tree and even to look at the pine forest. Okay. Because you know, the view. The overall view is actually important too. So the bottom line of what we have talked about today and also what we talked about on Tuesday is this part of the processor, the lower portion of the processor circuit is called the controller, okay? And its job is to use the microcode pointer to dictate which location of the ROM we are addressing. The output of the ROM which is kind of wide, it has 26 bits. These 28 bits go all over the place to the registers, to the demultiplexers, to the multiplexers, and blah, 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 okay? All of those things is really just orchestrating which component is active and which one is inactive, and how the pathways are established between the components. So the first thing we do is to determine who is active, who is about to update, because that will start, it will spark the first questions. By tracking down the answer of that question, you usually end up with additional questions. But by tracking down you know, the answer of all of those questions, then you have answered the question of, what is the processor doing in this case? Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> I'm just looking at the time to make sure that I got everything covered so that you can actually do your lab. So in your lab, you will be asked to um, the pro there will be a longer program for you to put into the RAM you know, of the processor. You will not be asked about you know, what, is, what each instruction is doing and how it gets the job done, even though eventually that's what you want to figure out. It is not a big thing for today's lab. 
So what I'll do is I'm going to give you a longer program. Okay, so once again, my browser is for some strange reason not working with uh, Google Sheets. So I will write a program that you don't have to understand. Okay, so I'm just going to write it here. So no op LDI A0, um, L1, um, CMP, nope, uh, and AA, JZI2, L2, decrement A, CMPI L1, L2, Alt. So don't try to you know, understand what this code is trying to say because you know, we are going to talk about stuff like this later on. Okay, so it is not important for you to understand what this program does. It just does certain things. Okay. Um, so make sure that it is updated. Okay, so let me update. No syntax errors whatsoever. That's good. So the way you put this program or the um, opcode into the processor, I'm going to demonstrate it again. So you go to RAM file. The instruction is in the lab, by the way, okay? But I'm demonstrating it here so that you can visually see what's going on. You go to file, you go to download, you go to CSV. And if you can control the name of the file, good. Otherwise, it's okay as long as you remember the name. So I'm going to just call this loop.csv. And then you switch to Logisim right here. And if you have to reattempt something, or if you're, you're getting a new code into the ALU, the safest way to do this is to reset the simulator entirely. Okay, So you go to Simulate, and then you click Reset here. That will also clear the content of RAM, okay? It will reset everything. All the registers, RAM, um, the multiplexers and whatnot, they will all be reset back to the original state. So now you can go to the RAM component, right-click on it, go to load image, and then specify the name of the file or navigate to that file. So in this case, it is in my temp folder. It is called loop dot csv press the enter key and the program is now loaded okay i think one of the questions wants you to run the code and then figure out a value of a particular register so let's go ahead and do this okay so the way you run this program can be using control t but it's going to take a long time to type enough control t's so that the program is done so the quickest way to do it is to go to simulate Go to tick frequency and make it kind of high, okay? Uh, 256, you can actually max it out if you want to. So just max out the tick frequency and then go to simulate again. And then this time you go to ticks enabled. So now you can see you know, the clock line you know, blinking, okay? So the question is, how do you know when it is all done? Well, when it's all done, the halt uh, output pin is going to be a one. This is the halt output pin. So whenever you see the halt output pin being a one, it means you can stop clicking. Okay. So at this point, you can go back to the simulate menu, and then click on um, deselect click, uh, ticks enabled, so that the processor is done doing what it's supposed to be doing. And then at that point, you can go to the register bank. If you want to, you know, because I think the question is asking what is the value of a particular register. So you can go back to the register bank, right click, go to view register bank, and then just you know, examine the values of the registers. So this is a process, okay? You know, how do we make use of the tool that you will be using in today's lab? So once again, you know, do not download the Google Sheets into Excel because it does not work in Excel. This only works inside Google Sheets when it is online. All right, second thing, a few other things you know, that is important since we still have some time. Uh, the other thing is you probably want to go to File and then go to Make Copy Of because you cannot make changes to the assembler the way it is because it's in my folder and you only have view access to the spreadsheet. So if you want to start to do this you know, and have your own assembler, simply click on make a copy so that you have a copy of this spreadsheet 
in your own Google Drive, then you can do all the stuff that you need to do on that one. Occasionally, some people would mess up the assembler. No big deal. Go back here, make another copy. Or you can also go to the history that, uh, of your spreadsheet and just roll it back to the beginning. Does everybody know how to roll back to the beginning or to an earlier version? Okay, I'll show you guys how to do it. Okay, because I think it can be helpful. You type control, uh, shift, control, alt, H. Okay, then it will get you into the version history. And from your perspective, you just have to roll it all the way back to the very beginning. So that will basically clear all the changes that you have made accidentally to the spreadsheet. So it's basically go back, it's back to the way it's supposed to be from you know, as soon when you copied it from my spreadsheet. Is that okay? It's a pretty useful feature with Google Sheets, you know, that you can actually just reset the whole thing back to the moment when you made a copy. All right. So that's about all I need to say for today's lecture. Um, but I also want to point out you know, where we are at in terms of our module in um, Canvas. All right. So where we are currently at, if I scroll down to here, is we are done with the D flip flop. We are done with more processor component. That's what we did last time. And um, we talked about the clock circuit, you know, which is the counter that keeps incrementing. Um, and then we took a look at the ROM, the RAM, the multiplexer, and the demultiplexer. So we looked at each individual component already. This is a file that I think you might find handy, okay? It is just a PDF, okay? So if I were to open this, you will see that it's nothing fancy. All it is is just, you know, a PDF <clears throat> with, both, with all three circuits in it. So let me put this into your view, okay? This is my PDF viewer. So that's basically what it is, okay? It is just the entire circuit um, in one single PDF, like so. So what you can do is to print it out, okay? I would, I would say print like five or 10 copies of this, okay? The first thing I would do, if I were you, is to use a highlighter and highlight the components that we need to track very often. So that would be the program counter, the register bank, RAM, the instruction register, the micro code pointer. Um, I think those are the only five. The flex register is important too, but for the most part, it is only useful when we're performing arithmetic or logical operations. So this diagram includes not only the main processor, which is the majority of it, but it also includes the other two circuits that you will find useful. This is the ALU circuit. This is the instruct. This is the register bank. So it has all three circuits that you need in order to understand how the processor works. So I would print like a few copies of this. If you have access to something that can print on a larger piece of paper, even better. But I think this is a big enough because I print it out myself. And even with my aging eyes, okay, if I take off my glasses, I can still read, read it just fine. Okay, so I would print multiple copies of this because you know, when you try to track down how a particular instruction gets the job done, you'll be highlighting lines and you know, highlighting the registers and so on and so forth. So it will be helpful. Is that okay? So this is a resource that I'm providing. If you don't like this and you want to say, okay, I want, I'm gonna create my own PDF, that's fine too, okay? You know, because Logisim has an export um, feature. I'm not sure how many of you have tried that out. So you can go to the file and then you can go to export image. You can also directly print. So you can either print to a PDF so that you can have that file and you can just have additional copies or you can export as an image then you can use you know, Microsoft Paint to highlight things, okay, if you want to. I mean, you know, <clears throat> the sky is the limit, okay? You know, basically you have all of these resources to give yourself the tools that you need in order to study this stuff here. There's, it's almost impossible for me to write instructions, you know, like what I was able to do with the other modules, because 
this is it. This is the document. You know, the connections between the components, I already gave you, you know, the, the most important part of how to make use of the diagram. We already talked about it today and on Tuesday. Where do we start? Everything starts here with the microcode pointer. Is that okay? All right. Um, are there any questions that you want to ask at this point? <clears throat> Microcode pointer, yes, that's what we talked about on Tuesday and also earlier today. Yep. Mm, what do you mean? You mean the microcode pointer? Okay, the first question is what is the microcode pointer? What kind of a component is it? Okay, well, that means you know, there's a little bit of a backtracking review that you might need to do because you know, the first thing you can do is to click on it in Logisim and it tells you what it is. It's a register. And we have already talked about a register or the concept of a register like a week ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to say that this is easy stuff, okay? This is going to take some time, okay? You know, but the more you practice, you know, kind of like doing what I did today, but with a different instruction, you know, the, the more you do it, the quicker you will get the concepts. And the quicker you get these concepts, then the easier it is to uh, understand the other material that we'll be introducing later on. So I think that's it for today's lecture. I am going to give you the lab for today. <clears throat> so the lab for today is to uh, make use of TTP ASM, which is Text Toy Processor Assembler. Okay, that's why the, the hence the abbreviation. So let me see, where is it located? Oh, it's right here. So today's lab is called Familiarizing with the TTP tool chain. So I'm going to unhide it right now. And it's only worth six points. So the point value is relatively low. However, it is important. Okay, so I want you to, I want to make sure everybody knows how to make use of the tool because this is what we'll be using until the end of the entire semester. <laughs> The access code is TTPASM itself in all uppercase. So I'm just going to write it on the whiteboard. TTPASM. That's the access code. You will need um, to run um, Logisim today. So that means you know if you are using the lab computer, you probably have to re-download logisim 310.jar okay because you're going to need that um, you also need to sign in to a google account i suggest using the school google account but you don't have to use that one because you need to make a copy of the assembler to put it onto your own drive yeah you know, while you're doing it might as well also make a copy of the opcode table and a few other files you know in the folder of the processor you know in my folder um about that's about it i think you know we are we are done for the lecture portion so i'll let you guys start with the lab portion <clears throat> if you're done with the lab you know and you have any questions about what we did today you know like what you you just have a single question about you know when i try to explain a certain part of today's lecture you know just let me know and i can re-explain that portion if necessary all right so I am going to stop the recorder right now.